Folks, the potential as well as the possible peril of AI has captured the world's attention this year. Goldman Sachs says 300 million jobs could be affected. Others say it will create trillions of dollars in new wealth. In fact, it's already propelled one company to soar up to a $1 trillion valuation just this year. And today, the global race to find ways to commercialize AI and turn it into profits is officially on. That's why two Wall Street legends, Mark Chaikin and Dr. David Eifrig, are teaming up for the first time ever on July 19th to reveal how artificial intelligence has just shattered one of the most important barriers in technological history. I urge you to tune in and consider what they may have to say carefully. Just head to AIRace2023.com for full details. The one decision you may need to make with your money right now, even if you don't realize it. And why 2023 will be remembered as the year the great AI race began. With over 90 years of combined investing experience, there's nobody better to cut through the hype, answer all of your most burning questions about what AI really means for your money, and help you find the real opportunities to position yourself to grow your wealth as this story accelerates in the months ahead. Again, Mark and Doc will go live on Wednesday, July 19th with all the critical details. You don't want to miss this one. Head to AIRace2023.com right now to make sure you're on their list for updates. Again, that's AIRace2023.com. It's 100% free. Hi, this is Daniela Camboni. Welcome back to the Daniela Camboni Show here on Stansberry Research, reunited with best-selling author Nomi Prince. She is a geopolitical financial expert and speaker and the author of multiple books, including Permanent Distortion and Collusion, How Central Bankers Rigged the World. Always good to be with you, Nomi. It is always great to be with you. I'm just thinking we have our minds using, using our minds to just get this information out to people all over. Please, yes. please. And I need you to help me understand the Fed right now because, okay, we have the latest inflation data that come, came out last week, inflation rising just 0.2% in June, less than expected. Headlines are consumers are getting a break, uh, finally breathing a sigh of relief. Not the people I'm speaking to, but that's a different discussion. So we have these numbers but yet, Nomi, we just had Powell saying the inflation fight is far from over. And yes, we took a pause, but more rate hikes are coming. So he obviously knew the numbers that were going to be coming in, right? So where is the Fed? What, what is happening? What is, the, what is um, happening, Nomi? This is, this is such a good question because I, I truly think that if we replace the Fed with a good AI, we would be far more accurate in terms of understanding how information is processed and, and what's done with it. And we take the sort of ego component out of it. So here's what I think is going on. Speaking of, of Powell um, and egos. So obviously we've just seen some good inflation numbers and that were basically up 3% over last year, down from 4% over last year in the prior set of numbers. Um, and, and as you mentioned, the, the incremental monthly numbers are, are lower than expected to just up 0.2% instead of 0.3%. All that is indicative of inflation coming down. Now, the fact that we are even still talking about the Fed you know, sneaking in another 25 basis points, maybe two other 25 basis points movements upward um, is, is really kind of irrelevant at this point in the scheme of markets, because whatever happens, inflation is going to do what inflation is going to do. An extra 25 basis points here or there is literally not going to change anything. For example, if we have a ratchet up and it's already and it has been still bad in Ukraine uh, relative to Russia and and more you know sort of heat in Europe, heat in the United States. We're going to see energy prices pop up. That's just a reality. At that point, inflation is going to pop up again, and there's nothing the Fed can do about that. So so basically, what I think is this is if we do have another 25 basis point move at the July FOMC, that is that is a vanity move. That is an ego move. That's basically the Fed saying, hey, we're not at 2%, which is an arbitrary number anyway, yet. So we're just going to kind of tweak around the edges until we get there. But the reality is, whatever the Fed does at this point, they have paused. They have said they're going to look at the data. We are at numbers from just a year past COVID. And our employment numbers are where they were at before COVID even happened. So this whole hot labor thing is is not even really um, that much of a of an issue right now. It's just something the Fed is still kind of focused on. But again, I think it's a vanity focus. Right. Because to add to the confusion, I then read a report in Barron saying that we're getting close to the end. Uh, so, right. There's just so many 
you know, different interpretations of, of what is going to happen. Uh, but how do you, I guess, navigate that as an investor when there is this much noise and, you know, contradicting statements being made? Yeah. And, and I think the best way to navigate that as, as an investor is to literally ignore what the Fed does if it raises rates by another 25 or, or 50 or two incremental uh, rate hikes within the next several months or not. Because, because the reality is it's not going to impact the quality of investments, the place in which we're investing or the way in which those investments are going to perform once the Fed stops talking about tweaking around the edges with respect to inflation. So I think we're at a moment here where we got to understand that the Fed did pause. The Fed did say, even though it wasn't in 100 percent agreement amongst itself, uh, you know, that, that, that we are actually looking at not inflation where we want it to be, but inflation near where we want it to be. And there's still work to do. But they paused. And so any of this incremental noise, any incremental um, adjustments, which I'm going to call them adjustments, not inflation in fighting rate hikes that could occur in the next few months if they occur, I don't think investors should be paying attention to them. I think investors should take at this point more of that medium and longer term view and say, look, at the end of the day, they're not going to hike rates by 100 basis points. They're not going to dramatically change the cost of money at this point. And the next move, it will be in 2024, not before that, will be a revision downward in rates. And we have to just look ahead at this point. I know. I know you've been saying that you think that's coming next year. Right. It has to. Well, it has to. And in a way, the Fed's giving itself room and, and they're not articulating that to us. But the reality is, if we do have any kind of a prolonged economic slowdown, I'm not saying it's necessarily a recession or something worse than that. But if we do have um, a slowdown in growth, which we are already seeing. Um, so whether that gets, uh, you know, from a numerical standpoint defined as a recession or not, the point is we are already seeing a slowdown in growth and that can yeah. only potentially continue. And here's why the debt overhang that all of us have as individuals, we, we as, as consumers, um, we might have stopped buying as much over last month, but we are buying more with debt and with more expensive debt and credit card usage than we have ever had in our history. And that's by the New York Fed's own reports and own numbers. Plus, obviously, as a country, you know, we've just pushed up the debt cap indefinitely for two years. Um, and who knows what happens beyond that? So, so we are basically already relative to inflation. Our growth has already Slow down. So I think the Fed is going to have to, as will other central banks, once they get the inflation bug out of their HUDs, um, will have to turn around and especially the United States uh, reduce rates sometime next year. OK, one more one more point on the Fed. Uh, another headline here. They plan to boost U.S. banks reserve requirements. The Federal Reserve's top regulatory official laid out a sweeping plan to increase capital requirements for the nation's largest banks in the wake of recent bank failures. Uh, this is according to a Reuters report. It's a move that was immediately met with criticism from the industry. Uh, thoughts on, on the latest? I mean, we stopped talking about <laughs> the banking problems, uh, Nomi. Uh, yeah. But what's your what's your take on the Fed's move here? So a couple of things. One is the Fed um, before the latest set of problems with Signature, with First Republic and so yeah. forth, um, did have a report come out where they said that 722 of the major banks in this country are technically insolvent. Um, so what does that mean? That means that they don't have a cap enough capital to meet deposit runs. We've seen that in a couple of banks and the banks are still teetering on the edge of that. We still have a situation where what they're paying for deposits isn't enough to make up for where rates are and where else that money can go, including to um, other banks, online banks or into other types of investments or, or money market vehicles. So so the banks are still on this tenuous sort of um, path. And at the same time, the Fed is still sitting on a book of over $8 trillion. You know, its height, it was just under $9 trillion. You know, they sort of dabbled down a little bit with QT, but they ratcheted that back up again for a minute when we saw those problems emerge with Signature and First Republic and Silicon Valley Bank. So what the Fed is basically saying is we basically still have over $8 trillion on, of money on offer to the largest banks in this country, of which most are members, the largest ones have larger memberships uh, of the Fed itself anyway. And they're just saying, hey, we just need a little bit of help here so we don't look as dumb when we have to create money later, which we will if there's a bank crisis. And of course, the banks are saying, look, you gave us all this money. They're not saying it like this, but effectively, you gave us all of this money. Um, and now you're saying you want some of it back. Well, you know, you gave it to us. We don't want to give it back to you. So, so that's the push pull that's going on now between the Fed and the banking industry. But, but make no mistake, the Fed still has a lot of money underlying uh, the banking system that it's not asking for back. We're still uh, 
you know, midway through July here, and we're still anxiously awaiting the launch of uh, Fed Now. How yeah. closely will you be monitoring the launch of the Fed Now payment system that the Federal Reserve has cooked up here? Yeah, so that is an excellent question. This has been in, in white papers and research papers for a number of years, and sort of behind the scenes, the Fed has been putting into motion this sort of this digitalized payment system, which effectively uh, competes with uh, some of the other B two B type payment systems you know, online, whether it's Venmo or Square or sort of the more digital payment systems that, that people and businesses have available to them to move money more quickly um, than between banks. That's the Fed's story, um, that this is all about financial efficiency. The reality is that in order to have a digital currency, we need to digitize the payment systems. What does that mean? The systems between banks and between banks and the Federal Reserve. And to be able to access accounts on both and all sides of those equations um, in a way that is lightning quick and also uh, creates a digital footprint. So without the digital payment system, you don't have the makings of a digital footprint. Without the makings of a digital footprint, you don't have the makings of a digital coin. So, so this is all, all about solidifying the technology in order to have a digital coin with all of what that means, with, with all of the, um, therefore, analysis of, of payment behaviors, of the speed of payments, the size of payments, where they're going, and the history of those sets of payments per every single user uh, that utilizes any form of electronic banking system. It is absolutely the infrastructure needed for one. Then why are they so adamant with statements saying, you know, fine, it's not a central bank digital currency. It's not. But why are they so adamant on... on, on on saying that we're not interested in one, we're not looking at one, and they've changed their tune a bit saying maybe we should be involved. Right. What are they afraid of? It's such it's such a good question. They they have been really dishonest about the entire backing of the system for a while, and they did put out the, the Fed recently on its on its main uh, website uh, a sort of set of Q and A statements about how no, this isn't really a CBDC. No, we're only thinking about it. But if if you sort of look back at some of the conversations that have been had in the past before it was more of a reality around the corner that on July thirty first. Uh, you know, Fed now is going to become a reality. Um, they were actually much more sort of thinking about it more loudly and more publicly. And the reason for that is they were competing with Bitcoin and they were competing with the crypto world. And they were not saying that, but they're effectively saying, look, we can't not be in control of money. And the order, in order for us to be in control of money, we need to compete on every level um, that crypto or any other form of money is 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 working in, right? And so that's one of the reasons why they said, you know, yes, we're looking at it. Then they said not. Nah. Look, we have a situation, Switzerland, you know, sort of the most secure sort of country in the world in terms of financial transactions of all sorts and types is talking about a CBDC around the corner. You know, we know that other central banks have done, it, major central banks, not just you know, El Salvador saying we're going to use Bitcoin, but actually CBDCs that are in the works. The CBDC infrastructure is in the works at the Fed. They have hired programmers. They do have people testing um, all sorts of the analytical sort of logistics around having a CBDC. And the reason they are, quote, like throwing us off the scent, and when I say us, I mean you and me, I mean yeah. people who are actually watching this stuff and have been watching this stuff for years, and, and also how we are even talking about uh, CBDCs to begin with which is that we had a financial crisis in 2008, 2009. That's where Bitcoin effectively uh, came to being. You know, we don't want a Fed-based currency situation. And the Fed is saying, on the one hand, hey, that's not us. And on the other hand, we got to be in control of it. And Fed now isn't that. But the reality is without Fed now, and this is just the most important thing to take away, without Fed now, we don't have a CBDC. So will they be coming for Bitcoin? You, you say that about viewing Bitcoin as a, as a competition. I mean, we saw the timing of the crackdown on, on Coinbase of Binance. Um, do you think that was odd? Do you think that was intentional? And are they coming for Bitcoin? Um, it's a really good question because I, I do believe that some of the platforms um, have gotten away with a little bit too little uh, transparency. And that could be a problem for, for legitimate investors and users of Bitcoin and other cryptos. Um, so in terms of cracking down from the standpoint of things going wrong on a regulatory perspective, um, I, I think that's going to happen. And I think that actually um, could make the entire use of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies more palatable to more people, which makes it more prevalent for more people in the world. But the timing of, of, um, of it and the, the general sort of stance against Bitcoin, with the exception of Neil Kashkari at, uh, at um, 
um, at, at the Fed um, in, in Minneapolis, uh, is that the Fed doesn't want to be seen as competing with Bitcoin at the same time they are competing with Bitcoin. Um, and, and this is exactly what's going on. It, it goes back to control, not just control of money and money supply and the ability to print money or digitally create money, but it goes to the very heart of, of what money actually is about nowadays. And it is about a trail of information. And that is something that the Fed knows and is trying to say it's not caring about. Um, but obviously, uh, you know, a digital currency will allow it to capture information. That's just that's just the reality of what it is. So I do think they have been competing with Bitcoin. I do think they don't want to be seen as being competing with Bitcoin. And this is why we hear and we will continue to hear um, both sides of the argument coming from Fed officials themselves. Making a lot of sense, Nomi. I want to talk about gold back currencies. We've been talking about it for so long and now right. it's becoming a reality. Yes. So... Um, we see that the BRICS are now preparing to strike a blow against the U.S. dollar. Last week, the Russian embassy in Kenya declared the BRICS countries are planning to introduce a new trading currency, which will be backed by gold. Now, do you believe the news? And two, uh, how far away are we from that reality? We know it can't happen overnight. How quickly could it could it happen? Um, again, really, really great questions. Let me just take you back in time for a minute because I was in Shanghai um, in China, a number of years ago, I was writing the book Collusion, and I met there with um, the senior officials who were effectively putting together the new development bank or the, or the BRICS bank. And the, the idea of that was for the BRICS nations to effectively trade with each other, potentially have currencies accepted by each other, and in the future, um, have something that backs them, right? So the idea of a gold-backed or something backed currency was was brought up um, a number of years ago when the BRICS Bank was created. And, and since then, there have been these annual meetings of, of the BRICS countries, as well as other countries who are interested in, um, in diluting the power of the U.S. dollar um, from a trade perspective and from just a, a currency and a payments perspective globally. Right. Um, gold allows um, them to be more on a level playing field, meaning if you have a certain amount of gold that ultimately backs some kind of a BRICS or just other world alternative world currency, um, that's actually a way to keep the sort of stronger BRICS countries and the other countries a bit more equal. Right. Because there's a certain percentage of a currency that would be denominated in gold. And that's one of the reasons why we've not just seen banks like like China um, or India stockpile gold, we have seen you know Turkey and other smaller banks also also nations also stockpile gold for that eventuality. So can that happen? Um, I do think it can happen. How long are we from that, and how much will that impact the dollar? I think we are years, if not decades, from that really impacting the dollar. And, and the reason for that is that it's not, it's not going to chip away at the dollar. It's not that more trade is not going to happen around the size of the dollar. It will, it is, right? The dollar has gone from about 63% of all global trade to about 56% of all global trade in the last 10 years or so, right? since the financial crisis. So there's definitely um, a sort of lowering of the impact of the dollar in trade. That will continue, but it will continue slowly. It will not be replaced. Um, I don't actually think it's going to be replaced in our lifetimes, but that doesn't mean there isn't a trading pattern here that's emerging. It doesn't mean there aren't more conversations happening. And it does mean it's good for gold because, again, that will be the, the equalizer. And, and the other thing on gold real quick is if this is happening in the United States as well. Um, and this that's is right. potentially this is this is like the most super interesting fact that I have come across literally this year. I was I was so kind of excited about it because I love these game changers in the world of money. Um, and especially with the world of money relative to, to real assets, um, you know, in particular gold. Um, and that's that in the Texas legislature, both in the Senate and in the House, and often bills get introduced in, in, in both the House and the Senate, whether that is on a federal level or on a state level, that just means there's agreement. And if you want to pass something as a law, you need both houses anyway to adopt some form of that law. So this happened um, in the last couple of months in Texas. Is that on the Texas Senate side and the, and the House side, um, there were there were bills that were created to effectively create a gold backed digital currency in Texas. Now, this does not mean that can be a currency if it passes that could be used throughout the United States on a federal level. But it is the first country and the first step to saying, look, we we as a state want to basically fight the overall power of the Fed. So we as a state, if this passes, will effectively accept a reserve amount of gold in, in our reserves at the comptroller, at the sort of treasury of Texas, that will be matched one for one, dollar for dollar, with any user of that digital currency backed by gold. So in other words, if I have a digital gold-backed currency, they have to set aside that amount of gold 
at the Texas Treasury in order for me to know that my currency is secure. And that currency will be used, if it passes, for any payments to the state within the state um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a state legislative level. So I can pay my taxes with a digital gold back currency. I can pay debts to the state. And I can yeah, pay that's... businesses who agree to be part of that interacting in the state. Now this is in the, you know, it's early stages, but this is, this is a huge game changer. And just even the yeah. fact that we are talking about it. I feel like we need a separate segment to fully understand that because right. It's not like they're going to have their own currency competing against the right, US dollar. From a constitutional standpoint. Right. But, but <clears throat> that's a game changer, especially when yeah. it comes to taxes for residents of, of Texas. Yes, and, and for gold prices um, in, in general, because there, there's, there's a number of, of states, Utah is one, um, I believe Arizona is one, that they have the ability, um, because of how they're dealing with coinage, um, which is, again, a whole other topic relative to the Constitution, but they have the ability to potentially introduce something like this as well. A third of the House in Texas did approve um, the motion of this bill to move forward for a vote. So that's pretty big, yeah. considering it's the first yeah. one that was brought up, right? So it might not happen this year. But if 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 the legislators involved continue to sound um, sort of the, you know, sort of the bell there, um, we, we can see more movement in that space. I mean, is it true that the Fed wouldn't even have the legal right to issue a central bank digital currency? Um, it's interesting. They, they, they can if they're settling payments in the digital currency. And this goes back to what we were saying about about Fed now, if they have the infrastructure to settle payments, which is what Fed now is, then they have the infrastructure to settle payments with the digital currency because they're digital payments and that opens the door for um, a CBDC. They can't require that everyone uses it for all of the, at this point, yes. in terms of current um, right. landscape, but but they can require that all banks clear, well, you know, in a limit through a CBDC. So when you're talking about these rebels and game changers, that absolutely I'm all for it as well, uh, challenging the system. Uh, what do you make of Florida saying, well, we don't want central bank digital currencies? Right. So so again, this this goes to the state level. So so they can on the state level. So it's, it's a flip of what we're just talking about in Texas on the state level. Um, they can and have decided that, for example, you can't pay the state with a digital currency. They, they can't say if CBDCs ultimately become prevalent as sort of the alternative to the regular dollar, um, that, that people can't use them or that businesses can't accept them. They, they don't have that power um, just from a legislative perspective. But what they can do and what they've effectively done is say for, for state purposes, right, the opposite of Texas saying you can use a digital back um, by gold currency if we go that way, if we vote that way, uh, you, you can't use a CBDC to pay the state. So, so they, have the, they have the jurisdiction to do that. They don't have the jurisdiction to, to change what happens on a federal level or on state to state transactions. Fascinating insights as always. Thank you for educating us. Nomi Prims, come back anytime. Thank you. Thoroughly enjoyed that conversation and I hope you did as well. So be sure to stay tuned to the Daniela Camboni show and don't forget to sign up at DanielaCamboni.com. I'm losing my voice, too many interviews. Thanks for watching. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.